itu. Good evening, dear participants, colleagues, and panelists. My name is Maria Antonia. I am a researcher at the Center for Greek Studies at University of Sao Paulo, and I will have the honor to mediate this panel, which is the fifth one in the fifth sixth BRICS conference from University of Sao Paulo. Tonight, we will be discussing BRICS 4.0, Perspectives and Opportunities for the BRICS in the Fourth Industrial Revolution with experts from India and Brazil. I would like to thank our professors Amna and Gabriela for their availability and for being here tonight. And for all of you, our participants, for being here watching this panel. If you would like to receive a certificate, please fill in the forms that are that is going to be sent in the chat. Also, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them in the chat and we'll be gathering them for the panelists to answer them at the end of this panel. So first of all, we are going to have the presentation of Dr. Amna. Dr. Anna Mirza, Mirza is an alumni of Delhi Public School, Matura Road, San St. Stephen's College, bachelor's degree in the college, master's degree in political science, Mr. Phil and PhD from University of Delhi. An avid traveler, voracious reader and vegan, she's, her academic initiatives took her, took her to the University of Duisburg Essen in Germany, University of Freiburg, Switzerland, amongst others. She is a recipient of Godfrey Phil's Golden Overy Awards, St. Athens College Centenary Medals for Carrots Combined with Learning, Bharat Nirman Award for Human Entrepreneurship, Muknaya National Award, Business Brunkers Women Achievement Award, amongst others. She has been associated with art and cultural professors books and regularly contributes columns to several newspapers and magazines. She has also pursued additional coursework from Harvard Ads. United Business Institute in Belgium. And her research areas include foreign affairs, international policy economy, globalization, international relations. She has eight books to her credit and as well as third, res third research papers in peer reviewed journals and has participated in more than a hundred conferences at national and international level. She has patents awarded from government of Australia and India and she has supervised one PhD candidate has pursued and has pursued two research projects. Thank you for being here tonight, Dr. Amna. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Greetings to everyone. Can you all hear me? This is just a sound test before we actually uh, go live with the thing. Maria and everyone, can you all hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, at the outset, gratitude to everyone out there. Greetings to all the wonderful people from India. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you uh, to everyone at the Brick Center uh, at the Faculty of Law, University of Sao Paulo. The topic that I will be addressing amongst all of you today, it's uh, something very clear, very close to my heart because I've been really nurturing and tapping this area, namely looking at Industry 4.0 and how do you know, one try to understand the synergies with respect to the bigger picture of uh, uh, international uh, relations. The topic, once again, as I pointed out, is something which is very close to my heart and I have been working on it. So on that note, I will start presenting from my laptop. Just give me a moment. Can you see the PPT? Can you uh, uh, see the PPT? Yes, it's perfect. Yeah, perfect. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much. In one minute. So here we are, folks. We're going to be talking about trying to understand, trying to map down the Ford Industrial Revolution. And we'll be looking at from the point of view of case study of opportunities and challenges for the BRICS countries. Now, as we all know, you know, uh, BRICS today, uh, BRICS countries together, they are 
a very important block together when we look at the global geopolitics, right from the, their contribution towards the world economy, right from their important significant place together as an important voice in international relations. The plan of action that I have with respect to the agenda at hand here is that we will first try to understand the fourth industrial revolution. Then in the second part of the video, we'll try to understand the important aspects of with reference to changes in global governance realms, and then try to understand that with respect to the changes in global governance issues, how does one situate industry 4.0? What's the way ahead for the BRICS countries? So once again, this is what it is that my presentation is divided over three parts, wherein in the first part, we will try to understand the fourth industrial revolution, the dynamics of it, and this is going to be slightly and uh, you know a confluence of in a present uh, contemporary business scenario and international economic industrial issues. In the second part, we'll try to look at important questions concerning global governance. And the third part, where in we'll try to understand the industry 4.0, what is the way ahead for BRICS countries. To begin with, you know, to understand what is the fourth industrial revolution, I take reference to the important research that I was doing from the World Economic Forum. As you all know, World Economic Forum, it's an important uh, think tank, it's an important avenue where a lot of brainstorming, a lot of efforts uh, are being done with respect to understanding the fourth industrial revolution. So the, the World Economic Forum says that, you know, when we try to conceptualize, and again, I refer to the work of Klaus Quark, that when we try to understand the fourth industrial revolution, it is a new chapter in human development. I repeat, I quote from worldeconomicforum.org, it's a new chapter in human development enabled by extraordinary technology advances uh, commensurate with those of the first, second, and the third industrial revolution. Now, this very definition brings me to the core of the issue that industrial revolutions have happened over phases in the history of human civilization. When we try to address the issue of development of human civilization, changes in industrial models have played a very important role. So the same applies to industrial revolutions too. For example, the first industrial revolution was with the, the way there were new sources of energy. The second and the third were primarily driven from mechanization to automation. And the fourth industrial revolution that we're trying to understand, technology has always played an important role in human existence. Technology has always been an important factor when it comes to human civilization. But the present day, I repeat, the present day scenario concerning human evolution demands that we look at the significant role of technology with respect to our lives, our livelihoods, and above all, with respect to issues concerning the future of mankind. And this is where the fourth industrial revolution becomes very, very significant to comprehend. We have to understand that the fourth industrial revolution is bound to play a very significant role and while we understand the significance of the fourth industrial revolution for the benefit of all our academic learning and uh, other research fraternity, we must understand that technology is nothing new. It has always existed with, with human civilization. But however, the present fourth industrial revolution, it tries to augment, it tries to increase proliferate the gains of the first, second, and the third industrial revolutions. When I talk about the uh, fourth industrial revolution, what does it imply? It implies high-speed mobile internet. We, it implies talks about AI, big data analytics, cloud technology, 
advanced imaging. It talks about uh, you know, drones, and there's talk about neurotechnologies, autonomous vehicles, amongst others. Now, here in this scenario, once again, it becomes very important to understand that today these things are not something that, are, that you know, for example, a textbook is talking about. These are things, these are the realities that we all are grappling with. Each day, the presence of this tech world is presenting new challenges as well as opportunities. For example, how the presence of high-speed mobile internet has an impact on the way mechanisms are carried forward in a workplace. For example, AI and automation have an impact on the rise of smart factories. Use of big data analytics is very significant while working out strategical operations for any global firm. Cloud technology, advanced imaging, signal processing are important avenues wherein countries are working to gain an advantage with respect to the power and global governance scenario. Drones, today every country is trying to upgrade its military apparatus using drones. Neurotechnologies are playing an important role in uh, you know, health infrastructure of any country. And again, uh, so this is just an example that when we talk about fourth industrial revolution, it's not just a textbook word anymore but it impacts our life. It, and again, as pointed out, that it's not that there's nothing new. Technology is very important for human beings, but in the present time, this technology has taken over. It, 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 no human being is immune to this technological revolution. Try to come to the second part, you know, that when we try to understand global governance, you know, when we talk about global governance, it's realism. That is the main paradigm. That is the main perspective used to analyze international relations. Realism has also witnessed various kinds of varieties or schools of thought. To give you an example, from classical realism to political realism to structural realism. But one common thing which is present in the realist scenario or in the realist perspective is that it is power which is very significant. And to understand power and its related dynamics of national interest, the three S of realism, namely statism, self-help, survival, are crucial to understand. So when we try to understand global governance uh, dynamics, namely with respect to power and related, uh, related issues, we must understand that uh, issues concerning international relations have always been built on issues like statism, power, national interest, amongst others. In this aspect, one must also understand that globalization, an important phenomena in the world history, is somewhere also related to these issues. Globalization, just like technology, is not a new phenomena. It has always existed in human civilization. To talk about when I look at the Great Silk Route, there was trade and interchange and exchange of goods and services. However, in the present day scenario, the idea of globalization is much more complex and contested. Just like industrial revolutions, where we try to map down the first, second, third, and the fourth industrial revolutions, globalization too has witnessed various phases, namely global, the first wave of globalization, which was marked by simple trade and exchange, followed by the barter system, followed by the rise of the spice routes and spice routes paving way for the imperial routes. In, and it was primarily after the Second World War where the form, nature, scale, speed of globalization did receive a degree of increase. After the end of the Cold War, globalization was driven by neoliberalism and it was highly contested. Namely, that of course, at one point, it did give us gains like rise of global firms, rise of issues like 
better choices, employment, opportunities, rise of global trade and financial apparatus from the IMF to the World Bank to WTO. But at the same time, globalization in the post-Cold War era was highly contested, namely that the gains were there but one cannot ignore losses like loss of jobs in the local market or, or the issue of standardization, homogenization, amongst others. However, what we are witnessing right now here is that globalization was highly criticized also. When we look at the populist narrative in Europe, in the United States, and among other places, wherein there was a critique that this globalization and the working of mechanisms and paraphernalia of globalization was somewhere elitist, elitist. It was you know, disconnected from the grassroots. And this is where the clarion call for deglobalization was given. Let's not forget how United States pulls out of the Paris Peace Agreement. Again, you know, trying to put global governance of the world uh, on, the, on the back front. So what we see here is in the present time, we are living in the post-pandemic world. And in this post-pandemic world, there's a strange confluence of words that are often used, a strange mixture of globalization 4.0 and the fourth industrial revolution. Allow me to under, make you understand that what do we I really understand by globalization 4.0? Globalization 4.0 was an important theme also of the 2019. Again, that's the time the pandemic did not start by then. 2019 World Economic Forum. At the time of context when the world was heavily criticizing there was a call to let's roll back globalization. Let's do away with globalization. The World Economic Forum in 2019 gives the call for globalization 4.0. And this, like earlier waves of globalization, for example, globalization 1.0, 2.0 and 3.0 is also connected somehow. Again, a very strange confluence. The words that I borrowed from a very important research paper that I used also, that I referred also, is a strange confluence of the fourth industrial revolution and globalization 4.0. And today we are living in a post pandemic world. Every country is trying to rebuild the contours of its economy, balancing lives and livelihoods. And in this, no doubt, regardless of all the criticism that we have for globalization, there is one clarion call that, that there's, 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 there's one important aspect that we know that technology did not stop the world. The virus did disrupt governance mechanisms for all countries from domestic to global levels. However, technology kept things going. It was technology that kept the economy moving. It was technology that kept the uh, educational aspect moving. And today technology is an important com component of development too. So technological changes, when we look at that, demand preparedness for a technological future. I repeat, today's technology is a force and it demands preparedness for a technological future. With this, let's come to understand that, you know, Industry 4.0 with respect to the bigger picture of BRICS. Uh, you know, it was during April's 2019 Hanover Fair that the idea of Industry 4.0 was officially presented by Germany. And in today's time, Industry 4.0 is a definite industrial model which has an influence on economics, domestic governance, industrial policy, skill development, youth empowerment, amongst others. So what is really needed is collective vision and efforts. With this, I come to the last part of my, of my presentation. That is, uh, you know, we try to understand BRICS and fourth industrial revolution. And what an interesting thing, you know, while I was doing the research with respect to uh, the stand of BRICS when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution, allow me to draw your attention towards the 10th BRICS summit 
wherein there were heads of state from Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. They were present at the 10th BRIC summit in Johannesburg. And therein, there were important issues like international peace, international security, global governance, and trade wars. I think it's always very important to refer to the context. At the time of the 10th BRIC summit, trade war, you know, and it was an important issue, wherein the dynamics of warfare had changed. You know, when we look at international relations, it's been a discipline of wars, First World War to Second World War to the ideological war of the Cold War. However, today in the present day time, the format of warfare has, has witnessed a change, namely where economic avenues are used to strive to get gains. So here in trade war, as you all know, between the two world superpower, United States and America was going on. And at that time, at that crucial forum, the 10th BRIC summit, namely at Johannesburg, raised some important concerns. What are they? Let's understand. With this, we come to the Johannesburg Declaration. And I've referred to Government of India sources, official sources from the news resources of Government of India. That is that the Johannesburg Declaration, the Indian Prime Minister highlighted the importance of working together to reap benefits of the fourth industrial revolution. There was this very important address, namely that there's a need to change the you know, curriculum of schools and universities to prepare young people for the future. And what is this future? The future is where the fourth industrial revolution has already penetrated with respect to the industrial models, with respect to working out skill development aspects. Moving forward, uh, there were important issues that were pointed at the preliminary session of the 10th BRIC summit. And we take reference to that. And what was that? That is today, digital technology are here to stay. Digital technology and innovation are important aspects. Let's understand that. Today, we are living in an era of disruption, wherein technology has become a currency of power. All countries are trying to tap in the best from 4G to 5G. So we have to factor in innovation today as an important aspect when it comes to the economic and other power dynamics. Second, talent is more important than capital. Let's understand that. When we try to understand fourth industrial revolution, the earlier perspective of land, labor, capital, enterprise as inputs in the uh, economic process, today we have to understand that entrepreneurship has changed. And this is where talent becomes important. One may have capital, one may not have the capital, but with the right talent, with the right focus, one can move towards startups, gain benefits of digitization, and most important, skill development and social security must go hand in hand. So when I try to understand the important highlights of the plenary address by Indian Prime Minister at the 10th BRIC summit, namely digital technology and innovation, talent being more valuable than capital, skill development and social security going hand in hand. This brings up to the important aspects that where can BRICS, and this is where my analysis is, that where can big BRICS countries uh, collaborate together? Uh, you know, let's do SWOT. SWOT implies that we look at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And this is going to be the last part of my topic. I, I know I've been, I've taken much of your time. So when we try to understand the opportunities, let's understand BRICS countries can overtake G7. That's very important because BRICS countries have the power when it comes to demographics, when it comes to geography, they are more viable as well as significant when it comes to their contribution to world economy as compared to the other G7 countries. And then this fourth industrial revolution demands a right strategy. Why does that need, why, why it is needed? For example, when I look at earlier versions of globalization, 
which were heavily critiqued because they were disconnected from the gracio. So similarly, when I try to understand earlier industrial models also and earlier industrial revolutions, they were criticized. You know, when we look at the Marxian perspective, why were they criticized? Because the issues of haves versus haves not. The haves gained at the expense of the haves not. We need to correct the mistakes of the past. Again, in the great philosopher Sanat Yana has said that those who ignored the mistakes of the past are condemned to repeat it. And, uh, you know, as the uh, founder chairman, the executive chairman of World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab also says that globalization 4.0 has just begun and we are vastly underprepared for it. So let's not repeat the mistakes of the past. Let's prepare ourselves for better integration with respect to fourth industrial revolution. This is where BRICS countries are very important because they can overtake G7 countries too. There is a need to understand that when we look at India, when we look at Russia, Brazil, there is a need for collaboration, but look at the look at challenges are important to be catered, that there's a skill gap. BRICS countries need to brainstorm that this a fourth industrial revolution is not an era of relative gain. This is going to be an era or a phase, what the neoliberal school would say, a phase of absolute gains, where mutual cooperation, mutual gains definitely present an important area. So there is a need to brainstorm on the skill gap. And there's a need to also look at the trends with respect to the labor markets in BRICS countries. Today, why this becomes viable and doable also for BRICS countries, because today every country is trying to work on economic governance. Economics today does not exist in isolation. It has an impact you know, human resources, employment, skill development has an impact on the soft power, on the standing of the country with respect to its international relations uh, standing. A good manpower, a good economy definitely gives a country an edge with respect to global governance, uh, standing and power dynamics. So today, BRICS countries need to work to collaborate, trying to understand the trends and impacts of Industry 4.0 upon the labor market. And then there is a need for better compliance and coordination when it comes to, it comes to technological renewable. renewal. I repeat, there's a need for better cooperation when it comes to technological renewable. Let's understand that technology is here to stay. But this technology is existing in the context of disruption. And countries need a better strategy to cope, to cope up with the challenge. So technological renewable, renewal, again, cannot be just a one-way affair. Better cooperation would definitely give better results. There is a need for two important issues, equity, sustainability, accessibility. That's very important. You know, as we said, that we must have missed out on the bus of global earlier visions of globalization and earlier phases of industrial revolution wherein the gains of industry, of economic models, were not available equal to all. The entire debate between global north and global south also comes on the important issue of disparities in availability of technology and our related income models. The fourth industrial revolution is much more democratic. Globalization 4.0 is much more democratic because technologies must be equally available to all. And it's very much doable too. So countries need to brainstorm with respect to equity, sustainability, and accessibility. And they're in one area, one economic area, wherein a right collaboration between the BRICS countries, that is with respect to global supply chain reordering, would really be of benefit in the interests of BRICS countries together as a nation and together as an important bloc in world politics too. So with this, I try to sum up my presentation that we are living at a phase where in the fourth industrial revolution is presenting some very strange questions to all of us. 
This fourth industrial revolution needs to be understood with respect to the bigger picture of globalization 4.0. Today's global governance is way much dynamic as well as contested. One may dispute industrial revolution, the fourth in the industry 4.0, one may dispute globalization and related globalization 4.0, but we are looking at a future where from artificial learning to drones to robotics, they are going to be a significant part of human civilization. BRICS countries together are an important block. And if they try to have a right strategy from technological renewable to global supply chain reordering, they can definitely offer a better narrative to the world when it comes to tapping the gains of fourth industrial revolution, globalization 4.0 in a better, inclusive and sustained manner. With this, I like to end my case here. Gratitude to everyone at the Brick Center Faculty of Law University of Sao Paulo for having me for the presentation. Thank you so much to Dr. especially Professor Cassio Sen, Maria, all the organizers uh, for having me. My good wishes to all the presenters, participants, speakers, and delegates. And this is what I am. I'm an academician, author, social entrepreneur, curator of ideas. Do feel free to connect on social media platforms. This is where I am on Facebook and on Instagram, Dr. Amna. So thank you, thank you so much. And I hand it over to Maria. Thank you very much, Dr. Amna, for your great presentation. It was very fruitful, and I'm sure that many of us learned a lot here from your presentation. We have received some questions and we will be answering, we'll, and I will be presenting them to you at the end of the session. Now I would like to move further to the presentation of Gabriela Schneider. Uh, Gabriela is a Brazilian lawyer. She has attained a master's degree in law and fundamental rights from the faculty, Victoria Faculty of Law in 2019. She is also the author of the book Fourth Industrial Revolution, Impact on the Third World States. And she's also an external researcher on the Center for State Constitutional Democracy and Fundamental Rights Studies. And she's a lawyer. Thank you very much for, for being here. Gabriela, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria. So good evening. First and foremost, I'd like to thank you all immensely for the invitation to participate in this panel to speak about such a relevant topic. And as Maria said, which is also my object of research, especially alongside such an important research. Well, during the pursuit of my master's degree, which had as research line the topic of fundamental rights and guarantees as one of my studied subjects, I came across the fourth industrial revolution theme for the first time, which at the time was still in the infancy state of all surrounding discussion and studies. And my first perception was the fourth industrial revolution directly impacts fundamental rights and guarantees, and therefore I needed to study it in a much deeper way. So I defined the fourth industrial revolution as the central theme of research in my master's thesis. Undeniably, I started with an extremely negative view on the subject and in fact, throughout the research of my master's thesis, which later gave rise to my book in Portuguese, Quarta Evolução Industrial, Impactos nos Estados Periféricos, that may be translated to English as Fourth Industrial Revolution, Impacts on Peripheral States. I maintain that rather negative conclusion in terms of the preservation, protection of fundamental rights in this new scenario. When I discovered that the theme of this panel would be perspectives and opportunities for BRICS in the Fourth Industrial Revolution, I couldn't help but think Maybe we will have a problem because all my research, at least until now about this topic, had always pointed to the opposite of opportunity for it showing the negative aspects that the fourth industrial revolution had on peripheral states, which deeply affected my country of origin, Brazil. That's why I will have to focus and explore the aspect of perspectives a bit further than opportunities. And although there are positives that I could focus on, my view on the matter hasn't changed 
from when I did the research for my book, it continues, unfortunately, to be negative. I do want not to lessen the importance and complexity of some of these the, of the, the themes, but we can consider the economic development as emergent, as the point which united all the countries that form the BRICS. This concept resembles the definition of peripher peripheral, sorry, is state that I made during my research. They are not the same, of course, but they share a few similarities. Nevertheless, if we are going to analyze them from the perspective of the fourth industrial revolution, it's very difficult, perhaps impossible, to outline perspectives or define opportunities that could easily be applied for all of the countries, given the existing internal differences of each of them. For example, India and China, I can see several opportunities defined as of now regarding the fourth industrial revolution. China, with the popularization of the internet, of online shopping, has spread its markets all over the world. India, with its technology, has produced fascinating advancements. But at least that's the reality we can see from other countries. That's just to name a few examples. Now, when talking about a country, country like Brazil, where I was born and where I live, social inequality is much too big. So the opportunities that could be somewhat generated with the fourth industrial revolution are restricted to a very small group of people, which ends up exacerbating the existing social inequality even more. As I believe to be speaking to people from all around the world, it's worth explaining something about Brazil. Most of the Brazilian population, especially the most economic challenges, derive their livelihood, their work, from activities with very few advancements of technology or completely unrelated to technology. And these activities with the development of technology tend to disappear. To put into perspective, in Sao Paulo, there is a very strong industrial center of vehicle manufacturers. Many of these factories have been closed. The pandemic furthered this effect. And as a result, many become unemployed. The Brazilian workers is still largely perform work unrelated to technology or that technology may suppress people who work in crops, libraries, teachers, and much others. They are not only workers with physical labor intensive jobs, but also of an intellectual inclination. Because of this, it's difficult not to consider the fourth industrial revolution with its many industrial innovations as a risk in a way to the Brazilian population, especially to the most in need. And from my point of view, the ones that could suffer the biggest effects, impacts, I'm sorry, to the working rights and guarantees since my research started from that. That's because the innovations of the fourth industrial revolution have the possibility of optimizing some production lines that still exist and still employ a lot of workers. For example, an editorial line. If we think about the replacement of printed books by electronic books, the impacts on the production chain and consequently of people that work on it are immense. And the same, the same tend to, to occur in uh, several areas with different chains of work. For example, 3D printing, teaching, the educational system, schools, even more after this, the experience of the pandemic which is schools and colleges in Brazil remain closed for a very long time. Therefore, the perspective I have is negative in the sense that the fourth industrial revolution tends to extinguish or at least make jobs worse in a sense of labor law. You may ask, but haven't this already happened with the last industrial revolutions? Uh, and I will answer, yes, this happened and this still happens on the fourth industrial revolution, but in a more several way, because before when a job was distinguished, there was always another work to do. Now the speed of the fourth industrial revolution is so exponential that there is no time to another job to emerge to observe those who are unemployed. On the other hand, however, there are positive aspects. We can see one of them in the health field with increasingly advanced exams, non-invasive surgeries being performed by machines and much more. But the question I have is who will have access to the positive aspects? 
if we are talking about the BRICS, will the whole group as a will the whole group now will the group as a whole benefit from this positive aspect? If we also add the countries, I don't really like this word, but as we also uh, add the countries considered as developed to the agenda, so putting the BRICS and the developed countries in the same scenario, who is going to really benefit from the fourth industrial revolution? Even looking among us, the BRICS, are all the countries able to benefit from the fourth industrial revolution? Or will some of them turn even more peripheral beneath the global world order? And if we go a little deeper and analyze the reality of each country internally, will their entire population benefit as a whole? I can say from the reality of Brazil, no to all these questions. And I'm not happy to say that, but it's the result of my research. So this thing, of course, is much more complex than that, but I will finish here, leaving you with these questions and invite you all to read the articles and book I have written. And if someone wants to discuss more about the theme, feel more than comfortable to send me an email, okay? Once again, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Gabriela, for your presentation. It was very insightful regarding the topic and was very interesting because Dr. Amna presented a very positive uh, perspective on the industri fourth industrial revolution. And here we'll come with another perspective of it and a critical uh, perspective regarding the economic effects and, and the inclusion of peripheral states in this process. Thank you very much for sharing your thesis with us. I, we have a question for Dr. Amna and we are still receiving questions. So if you have any, please send them in the chat so we can have a fruitful discussion. Dr. Amna? Yes, I'm very much here, yeah, yeah. Perfect. So the question was sent by Cassio. He asked, Dr. Amna, how can we use revolution 4.0 to go beyond the economic advancements and achieve people-to-people -people exchange. Uh, yes, you know, uh, you know, uh, Maria. As I was discussing, uh, you know, I must uh, uh, compliment, uh, compliment, uh, compliment my uh, fellow panelists for her uh, very, uh, you know, I would say not so positive remarks when it comes to fourth industrial revolution. Uh, but you know, uh, yes, these challenges are real. Uh, and yes, but I'm sure because the way technology and related concerns from security to social issues are, uh, you know, coming up, uh, you know, these are issues, but I, you know, I'm slightly affirmative, slightly optimistic that human beings would really, uh, you know, uh, or maybe countries would really make the most of it. Coming to the question by our very dear Professor Cassius and that how do we really connect this technology to people's concern. Uh, you know, uh, Cassio, it's it's bound to happen. As we pointed out that it's not that technology is something new. It has, uh, uh, it, it has always existed. But in the present day technology, in the, in the present day times, every country has to work on this paradigm of skill development, of inclusivity, using technology because when you're trying to keep your demographics and your population away from these technological inclusion you are somewhere going to be incurring a huge economic peril also and this economic peril would lead to further exclusion so it's good today that how from financial inclusion to uh, you know ensuring that there are more people oriented uh, or you know government schemes I mean, I mean, there's a lot of brainstorming these, it's being done. So yes, the onus to ensure that this present day fourth industrial revolution actually reaches out to people, lies on the government. But yes, on that part, you know, it's not just going to be governments only. There's a need on part of citizens also. There's a need on part of media, researchers, academia to brainstorm for the future ahead. Because, uh, you know, living in isolation is no longer an option now. Of course, there are challenges, as I pointed out, with respect to equity, 
sustainability, accessibility. But these challenges, you know, Maria, they're doable. You know, I was listening to the very important remarks by Gabriela, wherein she was pointing about the social security. And again, the big, big issue of loss of jobs. And I think this is an important perspective. And again, we, when we try to see that how would markets, you know, countries with differential markets, especially India, uh, and China would compete when it comes to manufacturing aspects where global supply chains are having an important bearing because of the new models, smart factories for industry 4.0. But irrespective of challenges, as pointed out that industry 4.0 or the present industrial revolution definitely offers still a viable platform to collaborate. And in that aspect, the idea of decentralization of technology is a must. And this is where the real test of governments would also lie from health to education, to financial inclusion, to entrepreneurship, to startups, digitization. Every country is brainstorming uh, out there. To give you an example, you know, taking the debate away from the BRICS, you know, uh, in 2020 at the G20 virtual forum, which was where in Saudi Arabia was the host country, you know, Maria, countries were debating that how can we uh, work on better societal gains from gender equity to gender parity with respect to industry 4.2. Today, countries are trying to work out that how do we get better sustainable ecological solutions using the gains of technology. So yes, I, I, one would not dismiss that it is a challenging area, but at the same time, one cannot do away with uh, the, one cannot ignore the benefits it offers. As pointed out, that even in the past, you know, Maria, technology has played an important role, but looking at its pervasive impact, the need is to better engage with it. Let, let us not be a victim of unprepared strategy as it was there in earlier industrial revolutions, in earlier versions of globalization. So I'm quite optimistic as you know, the process has just begun. There are going to be grapples within that. But regardless of that, you know, the very idea of ensuring that from economy to ecology to health uh, to various other dynamics, technology would percolate down to people and governments and alongside governments from civil society to NGOs, media, academia, all, all have a very important role to play. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Ramna. Um, we also have another question from Emilio that was directed to Gabriela, but feel free to later on answer it if you have any thoughts on it, Dr. Ramna. So the question is, Brazil is not taking part of the fourth industrial revolution. Hardly we can say it did in third. Clearly, this is development that having these developments have impact in the labor market. But in international, not take the inequalities to a deeper level. I'm sorry, Maria. I didn't heard all the sentence. Can you repeat, please? Perfect. Um, so Brazil is not taking part in the fourth industrial revolution. Hardly we can say it didn't hurt. Clearly, these developments have impact in the labor market. But in the international scenery, does it not take inequalities to a deeper level? Yeah, for me, uh, what is more important than that is that we had now four industrial revolutions and four Brazilians, not all, all have access to all the benefits from like these second industrial revolution, you know? So that's why my, my perception is so negative because much benefits that could be applied with the last industrial revolution didn't, the, the people here, some Brazilians didn't feel the, the benefits that the last industrial revolutions made. So how they will feel the, the aspects, the, the, the opportunities of the fourth industrial revolution. So 
I will be open to explain more, uh, like writing, but for now, that's what I can see from my research. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gabriela. Dr. Amla, would you like to make any points on that or you can follow up to the next question? You know, uh, as pointed out, you know, uh, Maria, the concerns, the remarks made by Professor Gabriela are very much valid. Uh, but having said so, of course, there's a lot of concern with respect to issue of reach of in the fourth industrial revolution issue of its sustainability also as a model because again one big fear with technology and automation and the future of robotization is displacement of human work displacement of, of jobs so these are viable issues but having said so you know uh, the way you know things are changing the way countries are grappling up with that. I, I agree that there is a differential degree of integration with the fourth industrial revolution, but it is here to stay as a process. And yes, uh, uh, you know, the way uh, there's a need to brainstorm on new security, social safety valve, the issue of decentralization, inclusivity, they're important concerns. But having said so, I personally believe that fourth industrial revolution and globalization 4.0, as I said, that this is a strange confluence. It's scale, speed, and reach on the human civilization on the power dynamics would be much more rampant as witnessed in earlier versions. What is essential here is to work on the challenges that are there. And an important challenge here is today, every country is grappling up with new laws for digital security because data is the new currency of power. Today, every country is working on new issues concerning uh, digital financial inclusivity. So yes, challenges are there and countries would grapple up with it. But uh, industry 4.0, industry 4.0, with respect to the entire picture of BRICS, it's an important area of cooperation for mutual gains. It's an important area where every country can offer better alternative to its uh, economic model, to its workforce, to better development of human resources, to having cutting edge education, you know, uh, it, an education that is problem solving in nature, uh, an education and industrial model wherein uh, the idea of skilled manpower, trained workforce would be an asset for the country and for the organization too. But yeah, there are challenges. I completely mm -hmm. agree with Gabriela's, Professor Gabriela's perspective. There are challenges, but I really, uh, I am really optimistic because you know the guys are discussing this in 2022. But BRICS countries, together as a bloc, way back with the Johannesburg Declaration, did try to understand that if, we, if there's a need to reform multilateralism and reforming of multilateralism in the context of trade war, uh, definitely fourth industrial revolution offers a viable alternative. Yeah, uh, whenever we, we have something new, like for Brazil, fourth industrial revolution is something quite new and it's always challenging. What we have to uh, try to guarantee is that everyone has have access to all the fourth industrial revolution benefits. That's why we need to try. Perfect. Uh, there are many challenges as you have considered and considering this aspect of the, the definition of multilateralism, as Dr. Amina had said, I would like to ask both of you, do you believe that if big countries cooperate to fill in the development gaps and their inner challenges, the fourth industrial revolution could be more beneficial to the five countries as a whole? Yes, of course. Absolutely, absolutely. If, there's, if there is a, you know, a right strategy of cooperation, the fourth industrial revolution would definitely offer 
better opportunities but yes uh, you know as you know uh, com- you know as an academic one should always you know uh, be open to understand both the sides and this is where us any strong policy or approach would lie you know with respect to the challenges pointed out by professor gabriela there is a need for countries to sit down together uh, and work on the areas of ensuring technology reaches to people on better uh, training on part of manpower with respect to people equipping themselves uh, with technology so yes it does offer opportunities but there's a need to also look at the challenges definitely thank you very much for answering this questions dr amna ingraviela i believe that we have very fruitful discussions and your presentation were very insightful regarding the BRICS 4.0 and understanding how BRICS countries can cooperate to improve their developments as uh, developing countries and in the, the redefining of this multilateralism order. And thank you very much for your presence, especially Dr. Amna, despite the early hour in the morning in India. <laughs> You're here thank with you, tonight, thank so you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was totally my pleasure, totally an honor to be here. My good wishes to everyone. Uh, you can see a lot of my lectures on globalization 4.0, industry 4.0 on the YouTube uh, because it's an area which I, where I really strongly feel and I believe that this is going to be uh, definitely a new dawn too for human civilization and global governance. My greetings to Professor Gabriela from India, Maria, everyone, uh, Professor Cassio Zen, all the wonderful people. Thank you so much for having me. Trust me, it was totally my honor. It was totally worth it to be there with you all. Thank you so much for having me. Finally, I would like to apologize for the participants because we had two more speakers to come, uh, Professor Vijay Prashad and Professor Ashraf Patel, but unfortunately due to internet connection, and they were not able to join us, and that was very unfortunate, but we are sorry to inform that. Also, uh, I would like to reinforce that if you like to receive the certificate, please fill in the presence forms in the, in the comments. And thank you all for being here tonight and joining us in this session. Thank you very much, Dr. Amna and Professor Gabriela. And thank you, Ibrashina, for the technical support during this session. Thank you so much. <laughs>